So, welcome everybody. Well, welcome to uh, Long Island Grown. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is the last panel of the 2018 uh, season, um, and I want to thank you for your for your support of, of this program. Not only this season, but for the five years that we've been uh, hosting this for a very popular series. Uh, let me introduce uh, today's panelists. I have uh, Stephen Strength. Uh, Screnta from Akabonic Farms, uh, Melissa Daniels from the Jamesport Farm, Farms Brewery, and Stephanie Sachs, who's a, a culinary nutritionist and author, and also uh, founder of um, um, Reboot Food, which she, I'm sure she will be talking about today. Uh, thank you for your participation. We appreciate it. Um, <laughs> I also thanks to Laura Donnelly, as you know, our, 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 our very capable moderator, who's, you know, the food editor at the East Hampton Star, and, uh, and, and also a wonderful local pastry, uh, pastry chef. Um, also, uh, many thanks to Edible East End, and to uh, Peconic Land Trust staff, who do so much to organize and uh, set, uh, organize the series and set up the room, and also someone that I've neglected to thank the entire series. Uh, maybe because he's standing right there in the corner, and, he's just too obvious. and that is Jeffrey Wells, who's our videographer, and, and he's been not only video, video um, videoing this whole series this year, but he has in, in years past too. So, a round of applause. For you. I'm going to turn it over to Laura and today's panelists, and. Um, uh, so, uh, thank you again for coming, and uh, don't forget to become a member. Okay. Thank you, Rick. You're awesome. Thank you all for coming. Thanks, you guys, for coming and participating on a Sunday morning. Um, so, first, I'd like each of you to just introduce yourselves and, uh, you know, explain how you came to do what you are doing now. Uh, we'll start with Stephen Screnta of Akabonic Farms. Um, Steve Screnta from Akabonic Farms. I, uh, I own and run Akabonic Farms and um, we uh, raise grass fed and finish locally uh, on grass um, beef on Eastern Long Island. Uh, and um, our first uh, newcomers, so our first full year of production was uh, last year. Um, we have been working on the business for uh, about a year and a half, two years before that. Um, I come to agriculture by way of, of finance because that's perfectly logical. <laughs> and, um, and you know, my family and I lived in in, in Europe um, uh, where I worked, and when that um, when when I was transitioning out of finance and um, and back to the United States. Um, my wife said she wanted to live in Amagansett, which, where we had a house. Um, and I didn't realize that anybody lived in Amagansett. <laughs> uh, I didn't think it made any sense, and, but we, you know, uh, we investigated and, and uh, it made perfect sense. Um, and that's where we're raising our uh, three young children. And uh, the idea was that I would sit on the beach and read books, um, but my wife it took her about two months until she told me to get a job, and so I started thinking about what to do, and 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 that's and that's really how Akabonic Farms started. Um, was around was around uh, agriculture and regenerative agriculture on Eastern Long Island, and uh, and I can talk more about that later on. But that's how but that's how Akabonic Farms started. My name is Melissa Daniels. I'm a co-owner of Jamesport Farm Brewery on Sound Avenue in Jamesport on the North Fork. Um, our farm is a pretty diverse farm. We've been renting that farm for the past 10 years and with hopes to buy it, but it's very expensive and it has full development rights, which makes it even more expensive. It's not in preservation. So we come from a background of we're horticulturalists. We've done production, nursery production, my partner for 30 years, myself for 25. Uh, we started renting this facility which has trees and shrubs on it and started to diversify. We specialize in 
green roof and green wall products for mm. urban uh, or agriculture mm. and urban architecture, living architecture. So we have a patented green wall system that we do. <laughs> we work all, all over the United States and Canada doing that product. But we still have to always diversify so that we can generate enough income to support the farm and hopefully buy the farm. So um, about five years ago, some friends of ours who were local brewers had a farm brewer's license. And a farm brewer's license in New York State requires you to use 20% of your ingredients grown in New York State. So some of them are struggling with getting a supply of local hops. So since we had a plant background, they suggested maybe we want to put in a hop farm. So that was a good idea until we figured out how much that was going to cost and how much work it was going to be. But um, So we, five years ago, we put in a two acre hop, hop farm, hop yard. Uh, we grow six different varieties of hops. And we experimented about three years ago with growing our own malting barley, which is a particular type of barley that we use to make beer. We found out we could do it. Um, so the second year after we did an experimental crop, we did seven acre, seven thousand pounds of bar malting barley. Last year we did eighteen thousand pounds, and we just planted twenty acres, which will be about fifty thousand pounds of barley. <laughs> Um, so our whole business model, our farm is really beautiful, we like people to share it with us so you can come to the farm and see where we grow the barley, where we grow the hops. The hop yard, if you've never been, is a really beautiful place. It's like the hop vines grow about 22 feet in a year. Mm -hmm. They're on these massive telephone pole-like structures with wires holding them up and they look like big curtains of beautiful weaving um, vines and they have the hop cones all over them. So we take our own product that we grow on farm and we brew our own beer and serve it out of our tasting room out on the farm itself. So you can come right there, you can take a tractor tour and you can see the hop hop yard, you can see the barley fields, and see the brewing equipment's all visible to you as well, so you can see us doing the actual brewing of the beer and then taste it in the tasting room. So that's where we are. <laughs> we just opened last August, so we've not been around for a full season yet, um, but it's we've been very well received. People love the beer, they love the place, so. We're crossing our fingers and have a nice, busy, pleasant summer. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Melissa. Stephanie? So, I'm not a farmer. Um, I actually kill mint in a pot. <laughs> so, I, I have been uh, cooking since the age of three. Uh, it was a passion of mine. And um, unfortunately, I experienced quite a bit of trauma in my life. And the way that I was able to uh, keep myself going was by cooking and learning about food. And uh, at the age of 15, I started cooking summer job in the health food store in Montauk, Naturally Good. We used to come out during the summers. And it's where I picked up a book called Food and Healing by Anne Marie Colbin back in the 80s. So I was doing this like way before it was cool. And uh, as I always joke, my friends were drinking <coughs> Coke out of Twizzler straws, and I was asking where uh, my chicken was coming from. And I was reading packaging labels and trying to understand what goes in our food. I wanted transparency. I wanted to know what I was putting in my body, because when you experience trauma, uh, life is chaotic. And uh, the way that I could keep myself as healthy as possible was, was with food. As I always say, we come into this world being able to control one thing, and that's what goes in our mouth. If you think of a baby, they can just close their mouth. And so that was my journey, and my personal journey folded into a professional one, where I went to culinary school in the 90s, studied with Anne Marie Colbin, um, and then I went on to Teachers College and got my master's in nutrition, and built a practice over the past 20 years out of teaching people how to use food to prevent illness and manage health. And, and understand that they have a choice. We all have a choice. Um, and unfortunately, we live in a very convoluted world where um, there are a lot of lies being told about food or what's being done. And I'm on a quest to just educate people and help people get nourished and learn how to nourish themselves. So I wrote, What the Fork Are You Eating? Um, after contributing to several books. And I have a private practice where I work one-on-one. -on -one. I teach cooking workshops. Uh, locally, I teach at Sangley Farms. And I teach very small, intimate workshops in, uh, we're expanding to do it in Montauk, which we're gonna be launching, launching in June, and also in Nassau and Old Bethpage. 
Um, and then I run retreats, which we're launching in October. And this is all under Reboot Food. So I've been doing this a really long time. I consider myself uh, not only a culinary nutritionist, but I live life as a patient because I live with physical illness that I have to tend to regularly. Um, I live life as a mom, as a woman, as a practitioner, as an advocate. Um, I have the privilege of being a part of some global organizations that are doing amazing, amazing work to improve our food system. And my goal is just to educate people and to teach people how to nourish themselves like I taught myself. So uh, that's my background. Thank you. Yes. Um, so Stephen, you went to Horton School of Business and worked on Wall Street with the investment banker, mergers and acquisitions, right? Yes. Um, Blackstone Group, things like that, lived in New York and London and all over the place. And now you're a farmer. Are you a gentleman farmer? Uh, like, how do you, do you see farming as your new business? Or are you like a back to the land kind of guy? Fresh air? I don't think any of that. I don't know what a gentleman farmer is. But I tell you, I'm not very gentlemanly. Uh, I find a lot of what we do very difficult and at times frustrating, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, um, I don't have a 10-acre farm. I mean, now you know we have we have over 200 acres that we're that we're that we're grazing um, across several different farms, uh, from Shelter Island to to, to Middle Island. Sylvester um, Manor, right? Sylvester Manor, yes, we have um, over, over 60 acres there, and um, you know, it's it's uh, it's a lot of work, and and uh, it's it's a full time uh, effort, absolutely full time plus. Um, to be honest with you, I was interviewing someone the other day, and, and, and he was asking for some reason. He said, "How much time do you spend on the business?" And uh, luckily, I had my colleagues on the, on a, it was on a video call, and I said, "Well, why don't they answer?" And and they said, "I don't. We don't really know when he sleeps. I don't. You know, it's it, and it really requires that. To be honest with you, because as you know, not only do we have to do everything in the field, um, but we have to do everything on the back end of the business too. And getting, you know, this beef direct to the consumer, it's a lot of work. And um, some of that is, it, some of that we're developing um, from scratch, because there's not a lot of beef production out on the Sterling mm -hmm. So yes, so it's absolutely a, a full-time effort, and it's uh, something that I'm increasingly enjoying. Um, uh, not not all days, you know. We we, uh, we had a, a tractor um, a tractor load full of duck manure get stuck on one of our fields the other day, and that that wasn't a, that wasn't a good day <laughs> uh, because I had to buy a few shovels and we had to do what we had to do. And, uh, but most days are okay, you know. Most mo you know, it's very pleasant to work with the animals. To be you know they. They know exactly what to do, and so long as you don't get in their way too much, um, it, it all happens. So, I, yeah, we enjoy it. Thank you. Now, Melissa, so you grow um, hops, your own hops and barley, and do you also grow wheat for beer? We will be experimenting with that. And I think I read, I don't know if it was on your website or somewhere else, that 70% of your own product is what you use to make your beer? We're at probably 70 to 80 percent. That's awesome. Yeah. So and I think, um, so I think there are seven hops growers now on Long Island or even on the North Fork. We've had a few on the panels. Mm -hmm. But you guys are making your own beer on the farm. You're probably the only farm tasting room. Tell us about the atmosphere of the barn and the tasting room. So the barn itself was repurposed. We didn't build a new building to make a tasting room. Um, the farm we're on was a potato farm originally. So the barn is a, an authentic potato barn with um, what everyone thinks are pallets that we put up on the wall to make it decorative it was actually already there. It's a venting system that they use to keep the potatoes from rotting. So we, we kept the barn as authentic as we could so it would look like the history that we're connected to there in the North Fork and people could really um, see what that operation was, but of course made it nice and have nice new bathrooms and, and a nice new 
a very sophisticated tap system with glycol chillers to keep all the beer very cold, so it comes out crisp and cold when it's done. But um, most of what we did in the, in the tasting room was to try to reuse or recycle whatever we could. We made tables out of, um, we bought the, some of the bowling lanes from the West Hampton Beach bowling alley when it went out of business, and we made uh, tables out of those, we repurposed those. Mm -hmm. uh, the bar is made from wood we found in the rafters and uh, ceiling tin that we recovered out of um, St. St. Joseph's uh, Convent in Brentwood. So the idea there is that you're connected to, you know, the brewery itself is open so you can see and smell and hear everything that's going on while we're making the beer if you're there while we're brewing. Um, but we're also, we have a beautiful outside area where you can see, we grow nursery stock also, so we have um, Japanese maples and uh, climbing hydrangea and different things that you can see when you're sitting outside um, on the farm. You can, we just put in a row of hops that are right there in the area where you're seeding so you can actually watch them growing during the season and then we do the tours around the farm so you can see the barley fields <coughs> and we run videos of us harvesting the barley and packaging the barley and drying the barley, sending it away to get malted and, and coming back of us brewing. So. We wanted everybody to be connected to the whole entire process so they could see where it came from, how it's brewed, and then into your glass. So they get to enjoy our farm, but also see how how it actually comes to being from start to finish. Nice, thank you. And it's big, right? It's like 3,200 <coughs> square feet. Yeah, so the, the, barn. the barn is 3,200 <coughs> square feet. That has the brew house in it, as well as the tasting room area and the bathrooms. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. OK, Stephanie. Um, I'm probably twice as old as you are, all of you, um, and to say that nutrition guidelines have changed, it seems like they change every day. In my lifetime, like the food pyramid apparently was a bunch of baloney. How have nutrition guidelines changed in, since you've been working as a culinary nutritionist? Like, what have you seen change? <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting you ask that just because the, you know, the head of, uh, of, the de of the department, the Teachers College in Nutrition Education, was on was actually Dr. Isabel Contento is on that that particular board of, of experts, along with Walter Willett from Harvard, who helped shape the dietary guidelines. And and so when everything moved from the pyramid to my plate, I was in graduate school at the time, kind of watching this unfold and Walter Bullen had come out with his book um, uh, Eat, Drink, and Be Healthy, right? Uh, and I don't pay much attention to them, to be honest with you. Nutrition because, guidelines? Yes, the nutrition guidelines. Because in the end, um, I think we are bombarded with this idea of guidelines and rules that we actually lose the ability to truly connect with our own bodies and what our own bodies need, okay? So as a general rule of thumb, yes, you want to understand. What we looked at <coughs> years ago was sort of grains, and grains could be everything from white bread to, you know, uh, brown rice. But now today, we're looking at more, you know, whole grains. We've got the Whole Grains Council out of Boston that is now defining what healthier grains are, or what healthier fruits are, what healthier vegetables are. And I think that we have a little more insight into that. But in the end, I think a lot of, um, I don't think I probably know, that a lot of these government-sponsored ideas about what we should eat are in favor of um, big food, <laughs> okay? So um, that's really important to know. And, and, and as I always say, <coughs> The most important thing is that we're our own health. We are our own health advocates because you can never expect the government to advocate your health, and you can never expect food companies to advocate your health. That's that's just the bottom line. And so, um, if you want to look at the dietary guidelines as in my plate, okay, to understand sort of what the concept of a balanced plate is, great. Super reference is Walter Willett and his information, Eat, Drink, and Be Healthy, that came out several years ago. Um, and again, you know, there's something called gut, right? We all have a gut feeling or a gut sense. And, and what I always encourage people to do is get back to that, you know? 
I was giving a book talk uh, when my book had come out, and a man, and I always reference this story, and a, and a man had raised his hand, and he said, um, so, <coughs> how should I eat my cauliflower? Raw, steamed, boiled, roasted, and I'm listening to him go on and on. What's going to have the most nutrition? And I said, stop. I said, how do you like your cauliflower? <laughs> yes. And he looked at me and he said, sautéed. I go, so then that's how you should eat it. <laughs> we just felt lost better when you said A hundred percent. People just need me to be able to say to them, stop, you know? We pick up, we listen to people from yoga class. Jimmy Kimmel does some great pieces on, on this idea of sort of these fads that we catch on to, whether it's gluten-free, whether it's juicing. And, and sort of like, why do we tap into these ideas? Do we really know why? Connect to what's here. So I, I do think that the dietary guidelines have value, I do, but I think in the end, what we know internally has the most value. So I, can't, I, I don't think we should put all our eggs into any of those baskets. Mm -hmm. so, Thank you. Yeah. Um, Stephen can, okay, I have a quote from you I'd like you to explain. <laughs> <laughs> Regenerative grazing is the most productive carbon sequestration of any agricultural enterprise. Okay, first, I doubt, I, I doubt, I, I, doubt, I doubt that's original to me. Um, that sounds very, very smart. But the, the, uh, <laughs> okay, so the, you know, one of the, one of the things that we, believe at Akabonic Farms that we have an unfair disadvantage at doing is is improving the, uh, the health of our soils. So we, you know, we, we take the view that if we don't have healthy soils, we won't have healthy forage. And if we don't have healthy forage, the animals, in, in my instance, the beef, eating the, the forage won't uh, themselves be healthy. So, uh, you know, we think of it as the beef being a byproduct of soil health and, and forage diversity and health. Um, and, and the bad news is that a lot of the farm, a lot of the agricultural land that exists across the United States, we, I won't say anything about the eastern end of Long Island, but just across the United States is depleted. Some of it is, in fact, functionally bankrupt. So not a lot in our soils uh, our soils are, are an increasingly so not growing any of the food that we're eating. And that's, and that's a concern, I think. Um, and so our goal is to, um, to grow food, uh, have the soil grow food in an entirely unassisted way by the soil. So we don't use, we try not to use um, really anything to promote the growth of our forage beyond the grazing patterns of our animals. And what kind of grasses do you grow over there? Mostly perennial uh, grasses and high sugar grasses because in order to put uh, fat on to, you know, an 1100 pound animal, you need a lot of sugar, just like, just like humans. Mm -hmm. um, and so perennial rye grasses and clover, high sugar grasses really what, what does it. Carbon sequestration is is uh, is just basically removing soil from our atmosphere. Uh, sorry, carbon from our atmosphere, and a, a lot of a lot of uh, cows get a lot of the bad rap actually for for um, uh, carbon emissions, and it's true. Um, a lot of that happens um, because most, the vast majority of beef we eat in the United states is produced in feedlots um, and there the amount of in particular manure and urine that is concentrated in that small area overwhelms mother nature and so it can't properly digest it if you will um, we through our grazing um, have on a comparable basis very very few animals um, um, per per acre of of land that, that we lease and we grow soil, and we grow carbon in the soil. And when you do that, um, carbon in the soil sequesters, it, it, it grabs um, um, that CO2 and stores it. Now, when you run a tractor over a piece of agricultural land, it releases it. Thankfully, we don't do that. Um, 
and um, and so that's what I if I said that um, that's what I meant um, and it was probably in response to someone saying your cows are polluting the environment <laughs> uh, so that's so that's that would sound like me but that's that's the longer explanation ah, thank you um, Melissa I don't, I don't want to be Debbie Downer but I read that um, the devel development rights for your property are still intact. So right. does it make you nervous that you're, you know, growing a farm and a business and putting money into it? Uh, the, the, our other partner is the owner of the property, so he has a stake. So it's, so it's okay? It's not going to, nobody's going to change uh, their mind? And I think that what makes me more nervous is the climate of um, sort of some of the town regulations and pressure on us. It was very difficult for us to get approval to do this, even though um, we were growing our own ingredients to do the, the uh, project. Um, there's pressure about the traffic that's uh, developing on the North Fork, similar to what you felt on the South Fork for quite some time. And so I think some of the lawmakers and policymakers don't know how to tackle that problem. So they kind of don't want to see more of these types of um, businesses develop where they're attracting more tourists to the area. So that that is more concerning to me than the development rights. I'm in the middle of a lot of farms. I doubt that anyone would want to put a residential development there right. um, because I'm sure I have a dairy. I have a large dairy farm next door, and does it smell too good there? So I don't think anyone would want to put houses next door. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Um, there's, you know, there's cattle flies and the fragrance of nature regular occurrence, so I don't think that it would be an attractive development um, parcel, but it's more the, the town uh, regulations and the kind of the, the backlash against the traffic, they, not knowing how to fix that, that I'm more concerned with for business than probably. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, Stephanie, let's toot your horn. <laughs> um, you've been on Dr. Oz a number of times, you are in a lot of magazines, you've written a book, you have a blog, you've done a TEDx talk. Um, what do you find is the best method to reach the most people with your message? <laughs> so funny. Um, you know... <sighs> TV? No, you know, you know, it's interesting. So, um, this is an interesting perspective. I've been on Dr. Oz four times, and um, I get a phone call one day from Dr. Andrew Wiles, business partner. And he says, I need to ask you something. Now, Andrew Wiles is a best selling author, right? He's like, I need to ask you something. I'm like, you need to ask me something? What do you need to ask me? He goes, mm -hmm. do you sell any books when you go on Mehmet's show? I go, not one. Not that I know of. He goes, Andy doesn't either. And I'm like, okay, I don't feel so bad, right? So what I find is actually one of the biggest challenges, um, because I do have a message, and I've been doing this a really long time. And there are a lot of people out there who don't have the credentials that I have um, and don't have the experience that I have who, um, who have a million followers on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. And as one of my dear friends called me from an editing room one day saying, you want to know what I'm editing right now for this television show? You need to get your numbers up on social media. I said, yeah, that's not going to happen. So. Um, I think that in the end, uh, that's a really good question that I wish I had the answer for. Because the, the climate and how we get information out is so rapidly changing, okay? And for me, my end goal is, is yes, reaching as many people I can, as I can with my message. But it's, it's reaching people where I can impact them and touch them with, with my knowledge, my expertise, my love of what I do. Um, and, you know, to me, social media is, is unnerving. Um, even television can be, but there, there are certain things that you need to do. You know, there's this whole idea that align with influencers, 
you know, influencers. So I'm going to go align with an influencer who has six months of uh, education and health coaching, and that's an influencer. And she's got, you know, 40,000 followers on Instagram. So I'm trying to, you know, I'm 49 years old. I've got two kids. I've been doing this for 30 years, personally and professionally. I have a resume to prove it. Um, and I struggle regularly with how do you get this information out there and, and how do I stay in my genuine, authentic self, which is how I can put my head down on the pillow at night and how I can teach my children what I want to teach them. And um, how can I also continue to impact the lives of others on a larger scale? And I don't have that answer, but I will tell you that, you know, you go on Dr. Oz four times, your books don't sell. But Tracy Anderson posts a picture but next to me holding my book. Hopefully people are learning from watching you on the show. Yes, hopefully they, hopefully they are, you know. Um, but in the end, the way that is measured unfortunately in this climate is by followers okay yeah. is by followers so it's it's a constant challenge but for me where I have to live is where I feel most comfortable and that's just staying true to the work and um, and then if it comes it comes you know so thank you um, Stephen can you explain to us the three stages this is a two-part question the three stages of a uh, cow's life from you know what it lives on as a calf to being a teenage delinquent to the eventual slaughter to become food for us and what are the health benefits of grass you call it grass finished cows right um so this is for this is for beef so it may be perhaps different from from dairy um the, so all all um, beef in America is grass-fed. Um, uh, when the animal is born, it spends time on its on its mother, uh, mostly on milk and and some grass until it's weaned. That's the first period of, of the animal's life, um, and so far no grain. That's all grass and milk. And then the second stage, you kind of think of as sort of that that teenage years, but it's really only a few months for a for beef. Um, and that's when it's growing. That's when it's it's been weaned and it's and it's eating it grass entirely, um, and it's growing bone and muscle. <clears throat> and 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 during that stage, it needs a lot of protein because it's you know, just like humans, it's it, it's building mass. Um, the third stage in America is when things sort of go wrong, and that's when that teenager is fully grown, uh, bone and muscle, and it's taken away and sent to. A feedlot where it's it's then consuming only grain effectively, um, and that's when the animal uh, begins to, to to get very very fat, but also get very very ill, and um, and you know our agriculture today has ways to make that animal become heavier, quicker, and cheaper, and keep that animal living longer until until it's properly finished, and then it goes to slaughter. Um, it's it's somewhere between it's somewhere after weaning, and before the animal goes to a feedlot that I step into the picture, and we buy um, the cattle that are right for our process, which is um, finishing that animal on grass, not corn. Um, and sometimes I'll buy the animal right after it's been weaned, and sometimes I'll buy the animal when it's you when it's. 14 months old, you know, so so after uh, a few months after it's been weaned, um, but in our in our um, in our protocol, we are finishing that animal, so putting on that layer of fat once the animal has been fully grown on local grasses um, with no grain ever, never any ever, um, and you can see that in, in labeling. Just to go back to that point, you know, if you look at if you look at um, beef in the supermarket and it has 100% grass fed, it's, it's typically been fully finished on grass and legumes, so clover for instance, and it doesn't have any grain. A lot of grass fed beef that in America is sold uh, as grass fed and it's been finished on grain. 
So you do kind of have to know what to look for in the label. It's a bit tricky. And USDA has abandoned us mm -hmm. grass farmers in that effort. So it takes, it's, it's probably a good idea if you know who's, who's raising the animal, um, because it's a little tricky. In terms of the health benefits, I would love to hear uh, Steph's answer to that. I'm happy to give one, um, but she is the expert, and and since I've read a section of her book around this, I think she could do a great job at it. And you do eat meat occasionally, right? Yes, but I know where it comes from. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't trust labels. You have to know, you have to really understand the labeling, and I deconstruct labels in the book, actually, um, around this issue, but around all the different issues that, that we see with labels. And, and, um, and so, yeah, I mean, you're, you're better off, you know, I always say you are what you eat, and you are what they ate, and how they were treated. Mm -hmm. And that's really important to remember. And so, um, in the end, you know, what you're looking, when you, when you have a pasture-raised, fully pasture-raised animal, what you're looking is, you're looking at, you know, a higher content of, you know, essential fatty acids and, and the animal in and of itself is healthier. A lot of chefs have issues with the grass fed um, because it, it doesn't typically have as much fat as the grain finished, as Stephen was speaking about. And so, um, as I always say, you know, I, I'm like calling all chefs and their customers. I wrote a piece for Huffington Post called Calling All Chefs and Their Customers because we need to get chefs on board uh, to, to start to buy into what Stephen's doing and what other farmers are doing um, in serving this and educating their consumers. Um, and I have the great honor of working with chefs and consulting to chefs on how do you better your menus and how are you honestly representing what's on your menu and how are you bettering the food system. But again, it comes down to cost. And, and we don't know the true cost of food. We're not we're not globally educated on the true cost of food. Um, and, and I think you can speak to that. It's, it's really unfortunate that um, it's you know, cheaper, bigger, faster, better, but it's not. So in the end, I mean, you have a much higher nutrient profile um, in a, a pasture-raised animal, pasture-raised anything. Um, and, uh, but again, the issue is, is you want to really make sure that it's truly pasture-raised and it is what it says it is. And so I go over a lot of these certifications and ideas in, in the book. So, and real quick, I mean, much higher levels of uh, uh, omega-3 fatty acids, higher levels of vitamin E, um, higher levels of CLA, um, antioxidants, and it, this is, this to me is the health profile of the beef. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. It's very, very clean. I really don't know a lot about that, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. I do know that I ate a lot of steak. I mean, a lot of steak um, at dinners and stuff. And there was a point in time, I'm 42 now, and there was a point in time, sort of when I was, I was around 36 or 38, where I would eat a big steak and I, would, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. I don't know what it was. It was, I felt stressed and, and I had strange dreams and I felt my, my stomach hurt and, and, I, and I just thought, oh my goodness, I'm getting older and how is this going to work? And now I'm thinking about raising beef and now I can't even eat beef and <laughs> what are people going to think? And, and, um, and we, don't, we don't use any type of growth hormones in, in the animals. And it's, I, think it's, I think it's a really big deal. Um, and we also don't use any type of subtherapeutic antibiotics. And if you don't know anything about that, it's, it's just worth a quick note on that. When an animal, when we know an animal is going to go from grass into a, a, a feedlot, we know that that animal is going to get sick, and it's going to get sick very quickly. And so what our agriculture, today's modern agriculture does, is it starts pumping the animal full of antibiotics before it even gets there. This is, this is, this is 90 plus percent of the beef that we eat in America. And so that animal is beginning to fail and the reason why it's hanging on is because they have preemptively pumped it full of antibiotics. And then they're able to finish it and then slaughter it and send it off. 
that's a lot of stuff in that beef. And so when you think about what it is that we're eating, um, it's not that easy. It's not, it's not that really, it, it goes beyond that with, with proteins, I believe, because you can eat, you know, you can eat a steak and say, well, it's just steak. There's not, the ingredients list is one. But if you really think about what's in that, it's a lot more. And so we don't use any of that. And I can say, and I'm biased, <laughs> very biased, I don't feel bad after I eat my beef physically. And I've had other people tell me that. And I do believe it has something to do with the hormones and the antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Can I just add something to this antibiotics thing? It's just to, there are an estimated 23,000 deaths a year, according to the CDC. Um, from these superbugs, that um, antibiotics that used to work on humans no longer work. And a lot of the ideas behind this is that our animals are so pumped up with antibiotics that they become resistant and they have antibiotic resistant bacteria and subsequently we are consuming these food products that have the same. And so um, it's actually a, a very, very important issue to get educated on and, and to understand that it's, um, you know, one thing that Stephen said was, was that, you know, they're not, not, they're not prophylactically giving the antibiotics. And that is key, prophylactically. Okay, if animals do get sick and you administer antibiotics judiciously and responsibly, that's okay. That's not the USDA organic system. It's an all or nothing system. So it's something to really educate about. Get educated we, about. We do treat our animals. Just, just to be clear, if you're going to buy our beef. <coughs> and as Stephanie said, if, if one of our animals has pink eye, for instance, which is pretty much the extent of the health issues we have because they're healthy animals, um, we won't abandon that animal, which would require us to sell it and then it goes to McDonald's. Yeah. Um, we will, we will administer an antibiotic to clear it up quickly. Um, um, the animal's, you know, uncomfortable. We deal with it very, very quickly. We take it out of our slaughter rotation, and once that has left its system, we put it back into our slaughter rotation. So, so that's, that's what, that's the way our moral compass points with respect to our herd. We think that's the right thing to do. Good. Thank you. Okay, Melissa. Um, uh, I was reading some of the names of some of your beers yeah. and some of the flavor <laughs> profiles, so I, I love these. Wicked Little Sister, <laughs> Wind Out, Waves of Grain Amber, Rose and Hose, Banana Fafana, Renegade Blue, Weekend at Bernie's, La Leche de Madre, Sugar Skull, um, I have a name for you, by the oh, way. Like, uh, and you have things like uh, chocolate, blueberry, banana, pumpkin, coffee. What's more fun, coming up with the names or uh, <laughs> brewing blueberry? The names are always a fun thing. The t-shirts are a fun thing. We have um, a very popular t-shirt that says, I got plowed at James Ford Farm Brewery, <laughs> that people love. Um, um, we try to be humorous and, you know, sometimes people, a lot of times that people come into our brewery, some are craft beer aficionados, but a lot of people are tourists and so they've never maybe had a craft beer before, you know, they've only had a Budweiser or Blue mm -hmm. Light. So, aside from, edu my, my servers are very educated about the origins of the beer and how they taste, but sometimes a name is really how they make a choice and they'll say, oh, well, let me try that weekend at Bernie's, that sounds fun. <laughs> um, so. That's the kind of way to make it approachable, because I think sometimes people think um, craft beer can be a little bit elitist and it's hard for them to connect to it, so if it's an approachable name and it's fun, then okay, I'll have one of those and give it a try. <laughs> okay, my name, my name for one of your beers is IHOP. This is terrible, right? I love it. IHOP IPA. Put a little maple, little maple bacon, syrup flavor. Um, also, you know, there's like, you know, farm to table, dock to dish, farm to pint. I have one for you, too. Hoof to house. We've heard ground to growler, too, as well. Another. Ground to growler. 
-hmm. like ground and rally. Now, I also yeah. saw that one of yours was, but I didn't see it on your website mm -hmm. as being available. Maybe you got rid of the name Ex Wife. Yeah, Ex Wife was an extra special bitter beer. So. <laughs> <laughs> questions from the audience, but I want to ask, well, you know, anybody, but specifically Stephen and Stephanie, and Melissa, if you've ever had one, have you guys tried the Impossible Burger? You haven't? Do you know what it is? Is that the vegan, one of the, Beyond Meat? Is that like another? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's from the Impossible. It's yeah. genetically modified, oh. uh, yeah, soy-based, yeah. uh, mm. But it's yeah, it's very close to beef. But uh, I tried one and did a story on it. But I, uh, it's good. It's ninety percent there, which is pretty amazing. And uh, I brought the leftovers home for my dog, and she did not discriminate. <laughs> I, they make them. They're cooking them at Rowdy Hall in East Hampton right now. Oh, that's right. I, I saw it on. I saw it on the menu. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And for people who have been bitten by the tick. You know that has carries the uh, mm -hmm. allergy. I uh, forget what it's called. Alpha, yeah. Alpha, yeah. Alpha, yeah. yeah. Alpha gal. Alpha gal. Yeah. Um, this is a good thing for them to be able to do if they have to. Yeah. It doesn't taste like beans and cumin. It looks like meat. It's got the texture. Okay. I don't, I don't need to be talking about this. Um, <laughs> Stephanie, I just I can't resist asking you. Oh God. How, what? How do you? Oh, two things. But quick answers. Um, what are your opinions of like paleo and Atkins diets and is there a diet program, say for instance DASH, the DASA mm -hmm. dietary approaches to stop hypertension, mm -hmm. which seems pretty weird. But how do you feel like a South Beach diet, paleo, Atkins? Mm -hmm. Um, so I had this class in graduate school called Analysis of Current Literature, and we were charged with breaking up into groups and taking, each of us had to take one of these diet books, I had the zone, and completely deconstruct them and figure out if, there were, if they were based in science and where their validity, where their vi validity lay and um, how and if we would recommend it. And the general consensus from everybody in the room who did different books was that there was absolutely no scientific validity on any of them. Um, and that they're just really fads and theories and ideas and um, in the end we're individuals and I think that we have to figure out what works for us. I am not anti-paleo, I'm not anti, you know, um, keto, like an Atkins diet which has its merits if you have brain cancer. Okay, but I think in the end what we have to do is not look at these as general dietary prescriptions. We have to understand what they mean, why would we be using them, and what kind of guidelines they're going to provide us with. I always go to this. If, if you want to just learn the basic rules of eating healthy without subscribing to any of the foods that they put out in the marketplace, Weight Watchers is a great approach in terms of teaching portion size because in the end, that's what it's about, is balance and portion size. <coughs> so in the DASH diet, of course, because that is gonna teach you, you know, about hypertension, and it's also kind of formulated also on the Weight Watchers principles. Yeah, and just so, more whole grains and exactly. not, not actually yeah. that much protein. Um, Stephen, yeah. how often do you and your family eat beef? Do you like it? Do you love it? Well, I used to eat a lot of beef. Um, I, my wife does my. I tell you, you know, my wife has issues with um, with serving my beef. She, you know, um, she knows the cow. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. And uh, you know, I admit it. You know, it's she struggles with it because she sees us out there with the animals, and and uh, the animals have personalities, and you know, they sacrifice a lot, and um, she uses a lot of. Uh, of my ground beef and the burger patties. Um, I have I have the greatest taste testing crew, which are my three young children. And so- How old are they? They're uh, 12, uh, 10, and eight. Mm -hmm. And so on the weekends, we have, we have constantly, we constantly have beef because I'm making them 
I'm making them give me feedback on right. the, and um, and they love it, right? Uh, my daughter, she's a tough critic, but she, you know, she she likes most of it. And um, but other than other than that, we we actually have chicken a lot. Um, when we do have beef, uh, I'd like to think it's mine, but I can't even say that because well, my beef is frozen, um, and it does take a little bit of planning ahead to move it from the freezer to the refrigerator and sometimes we're not so good at that. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times we have our beef and we do, we, do, we do eat it a bit but not as much as you'd think as a, as a beef farmer. Okay, thank you. Um, Melissa, what is your favorite food and beer pairing? Which of your beers, you know, and it could be seasonal. Um, Grilled meats and like barbecued meats go well with IPAs, mm -hmm. so that's a good pairing. Um, believe it or not, um, we have a brown ale that has a lot of very strong coffee and chocolate notes, so that's actually good with the dessert. Mm -hmm. it's hard to believe that you would drink beer with dessert, but actually that does go well. Um, I would say those would be my two favorites. Sounds good. Puts me in the mood for I thought you were going to ask me if I drink a lot of beers. <laughs> <laughs> How often do I drink beer? Do you, drink a lot of beer? <laughs> you know, like you said, not as much as you think because you kind of are around it all the time and you kind of say, oh, well. Well, we've, we've had bacon you have on to the taste panel. You have to taste like, it. Like, no oysters from yeah. me. And you and other ones are out there, you know, farming them and gulping them down in the morning. Well, we have to taste it all the time to test for levels yes. of different matter, and so you kind of get a little beard out after a while. Yeah. Like, okay, no more beer for beer. <laughs> so. Stephanie, what's your favorite food and beverage pairing? <laughs> my favorite food and beverage pairing. Oh my gosh, I have so many favorite foods, but water's my favorite beverage. Um, or my green drink that I make, which is like a green smoothie. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, I love seafood. I love a great seafood, whether it's on a grill or broiled uh, um, with fresh vegetables. And, and sometimes um, I love roasted potatoes or quinoa. I'm kind of boring like that. What's a guilty pleasure? My, you're gonna die when I tell you this. It's actually really embarrassing. <laughs> My guilty pleasure is green tea at Starbucks. Plain green green tea at Starbucks. Sorry, no sweet. Not, that's not a guilty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's because I don't spend it much. No, no. <laughs> yes. Okay. I don't really. Um, I do not really. Uh, um, I don't see food that way. You know, it's it's interesting. I don't see food that way because I eat what I want, and I don't see anything as a. That's good. Guilt. That's good. Yeah. Good. I just eat what I want when I want it, and um, no marshmallow fluff or French fries. No, 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 I love French fries, but I, I don't see that as a guilty pleasure. I eat them when I want them. You good. Know? But I eat everything and sort of, you know, moderation. I monitor how I'm feeling. You know, I live with autoimmune disease. I live with a kidney disease, and so I have to keep myself in check. You know, and say, okay, if I'm feeling this way, I'm not going to have the French fries tonight, or. You know, so it, it's, um, but literally my guilty pleasure is this tea. Like I get, I'm like, oh my God, I walked in with a Starbucks cup. Like that's what happens. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I don't like giving them money, but it's I my whoopee. I didn't notice that. <laughs> it is my whoopee. And I think it has to do with, I wrote my book. I, I, I spent a lot of time at Starbucks writing my book. Because it gets really lonely writing the book. And like sitting at home, I, you know, if I didn't have to make calls, I was like, Headphones and sitting in Starbucks. Mm -hmm. So it became my whoopee. <laughs> okay, uh, questions from the audience for any of our wonderful panelists? Yes, in the back, way where, back. Where, where, can, where can your beef be obtained? Oh, yeah, I was going to ask. Thank you for asking that. That's, um, <laughs> thank you. I, so I thought, it's, I thought it very important to, to um, be able to get the beef. Uh, very easily into the hands direct to the consumer. So, so I set up in parallel all the logistics to go from my website to your front door within two days. Um, anywhere in the United States. Yeah. So, um, so the, there's a little card outside on the table that I brought 
Good. It has the website. It's got even a little uh, some amount off, and um, and and so that's that's the way I'd love to sell all my beef. But you know, the other way that we're working um, to get the beef out is through beef shares on local CSAs, which now we've got I think four or five CSAs that are offering our beef side by side to their veggies, which I think is great. We can offer we can offer the beef at a much lower price point. Um, and um, and uh, that would be the second way, and then and then over time, I think we'll do more health food stores and perhaps <coughs> dabble a little bit with some restaurants, but not not too much of that. Thank you. Yes. Uh, question, uh, Stephanie. I think uh, <clears throat> when when and and if uh, are we ever going to see uh, proper labeling? On products, not only labeling and so far as uh, origin and how the product was uh, formed, but also the date of expiration. That is a real pain in the neck. And when you look at something, it's all either, either it's not there or it's not legible, even mm -hmm. if it's stamped on with a stamping machine. Right. It's, it's ludicrous. I mean, you the have to watch every time dates. you go into a store right. and check the cans, the bottle, or whatever you're buying, to make sure it's not going to be obsolete. It's, so You're not supposed to think that stuff won't show up on that Well, so I'm going to, I'll first answer the expiration dating. So the NRDC, which is the Natural Resources Defense Council, um, Dana Gunders, who works there, she, she has done extraordinary research into, um, into labels and dates. And um, I actually incorporated a lot of her research in my book on that exact topic because this sell by buy you know buy. sell by buy buy you know um, a lot of these dates are very off and they're actually for the retailers they're not for the consumers and so a lot of food is actually getting wasted that doesn't need to be wasted for example okay and I talk a lot about this in the book now in terms of um, so you're kind of um, you're on your own with a lot of these decisions, right? Which leads me to this labeling aspect, which um, when are we gonna see? Um, <coughs> I hate to say this, <laughs> but I will, because I'm just gonna be honest. We are never gonna see truly transparent labeling on food, ever, okay? Our government gets paid off by food industry, and that's just the bottom line, okay? Our USDA organic label is completely diluted now. <coughs> Okay, there are an allowable list of pesticides permitted in USDA organic foods. Okay. Monsanto has a lot of money. <laughs> yes, Monsanto does have a lot of money and a lot of power, unfortunately. Okay. Um, what I find uh, I hopeful, you know, and I was once asked this question by an NYU student um, when I was speaking there, why did you write the book? that you did with the perspectives that you did. And I said, because there's not an encyclopedia out there for people to actually gain tools to make better choices. And so if you can't trust something, know you can't trust it, and understand, because I offer a lot of directives in the book, understand what you can do to be the healthiest you within the context of what we have. You know, when I talk about GMOs, harsh reality, we're probably all consuming them on some level every single day. I don't know. I'd rather know that than pretend that that's not happening. And so what I, what I just, you know, I would love to be hopeful and I would love to say yes. You know, we've got a future of, of clear. clear, honest labeling. But I've been at this for 30 years, personally and professionally, and it's only gotten worse. And now what we have is we have this whole, you know, back in the 80s, actually, the labeling, even though there weren't, let's say, formal certifications, um, the reality is, is there was, uh, there was an honesty and an authenticity in labeling. And then what happens, we have this whole idea of greenwashing that comes in. So, and this happened with USDA Organic. You have something called Certified Naturally Grown, which is like the old organic, which a lot of local farmers get because they don't want to or can't afford to pay for USDA organic. And so 
what what essentially um, has happened is because we have this greenwashing movement, healthy, organic, you know, um, you're believing all of that, but you're actually being lied to. Well, that's, that's the point. <laughs> right, and so that's why I had to write the book that I wrote. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Oh, Stephanie, I have a question for you. You talked earlier about how to connect with people so that your message is really absorbed and really, you know, listened to. So um, I struggle sometimes as well with, with people. I'm a small grower of microgreens and you know, medicinal herbs and wheatgrass and such. And so a lot of times I invite groups of people into my kitchen because I feel like it's my home and you're there and it just has an impact to see the food growing in these 10 or 11 day cycles and then they're just tasting how fresh it is and you can do this on your own, etc. And so I, I, I get frustrated because people know what's good for them. I just tell them, well, you know, look outside. Like, what is growing in the earth? That's probably what we should be eating. But it's difficult because we know what's good for us and even I struggle with like sugar and different things. But when I read Michael Pollan's Omnivore's Dilemma, mm -hmm. he said, his quote was like, eat, eat plants, you know, yep. eat food, like, mostly, mostly plants, plants not and very little. Much. And he talked about um, non-food edibles, such as, you know, processed food and things. And really, if we just like eat like more of what is natural and less of what it's processed, I feel like we're tipping the scales. But again, it's something very hard to, you know, really just listen to. So I want to know what, how you felt about that, but that message of like... Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, I, I think in the end, you know, what Michael says is eat food, mostly plants, not too much, right? And, and his food rules, which is just a hundred quick food, food rules, is a great Bible. Um, but in the end, what I've learned over time, because years ago when I started out, you know, it was more like you've got to do this, you've got to do this, you know, and, and I've learned a lot along the way, and um, everybody has a different starting point, okay, and the only thing we can control is ourselves and what we put out there, and um, perhaps with, as I always say, take one small thing away from what I do, and, and I've made an impact. Okay, as everyone that I get to work with makes an impact on my life. So I think the key is, is letting go of trying to change people um, and, and instead just put the information out there, put the love out there, put the nourishment out there and the people who are ready will come. And, and that's really where you have to be in this space. Um, and, and, you know, I consult to people who are developing products. I consult to chefs. I, and, and in the end, um, I stick to what it is that, that I believe and what it is that I know. And that everybody has a different starting point. Um, I'm not going to make the person who's drinking five Cokes a week who comes to me for help. I'm not going to look at that person and say, cut the Coke, can never do it again. Because I'm going to lose her. I'm going to say, can we cut that down to maybe three a week? And this is why, and I'll present the facts. It's up to her what she does. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's what it boils down to. Good. Okay. Um, how about one or two short questions with short answers, and then, <laughs> then we move into, okay, go ahead. Uh, where do you get your seafood? Fresh seafood. Where do you I get my seafood? Yes. Um, well, my friend started Dr. Dish, so I'm a little spoiled that way. Sean Barrett. Sean Barrett. He had on one of these. Yes, um, and then I live in Montauk, so yeah, but I also, where do you get fresh seafood? So I will buy, um, I sometimes buy actually frozen, caught in the U.S. seafood, like if I'm grocery shopping, I don't ever, I'll go to a fishmonger and I'll ask a lot of questions and they don't like when I come in, <laughs> put it that way. So, so I'll go, you know, I live in Montauk, so I'll go to Gosman's and ask a lot of questions, or I'll go to Stewart's and talk to Charlotte there. I live there. here, and I would like to buy just one piece of fish, not a huge yeah. frozen. So, seafood fish. shop in Wainscott. Yeah, yeah, seafood shop in Wainscott. And, and ask questions, you know, ask... I don't have to ask questions. If they have fresh seafood, I buy it. <laughs> Wainscott seafood yeah. shop. Okay. Okay. But yes. That's near the, near the light. Yes, yes exactly. right near the Bagel Place on the highway. Yes, next yes. yes. to Goldberg's. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Stephen, how much of an impediment is the lack of a local slaughterhouse? 
Oh yes, yes. That's okay. a great question. Yeah. Go. Yeah, it's um. So here's maybe the same surprise. It's, it depends on what business you're in. Um, so what I mean by that is, if it is your business to process a, a large amount of animals, yeah. it's actually not the worst thing in the world. Um, uh, if you're if you're producing just a few head of livestock, whatever that may be, it's very difficult to build that into your day to day. You got to have the right equipment. You have to travel far distances. You have to. We have to matter to a slaughter facility that exists in Pennsylvania or in Connecticut or wherever, and it becomes very difficult. Um, you know, we now, where we are with our volumes, I find it actually quite easy, right? And let me just put, I'll put it, it's, it, it's easier, financially at least, um, to bring our animals to our facilities, one in, in, at the moment in Connecticut and the other in Nazareth, Pennsylvania. Um, that's not to say that I haven't spent a massive amount of time, in fact more than two years, trying to work with Suffolk County and Cornell to get the, the slaughter facility that exists, USDA slaughter facility, in Yapank into private hands. And they've, they've done two rounds of bids, uh, it's not a secret, um, and even if it is I don't mind telling you because I'm the party, I was the only one to bid twice. And I didn't, I didn't win twice. Um, <laughs> and my background is in mergers and acquisitions, to be honest. That's like a, a major disappointment. Um, the, uh, the reality is this, real quick. Slaughter is high volume, low margin. So unless you have high volume, it's going to lose a lot of money. Eastern Long Island doesn't have a lot of volume of livestock. So until the volumes get there, it doesn't make financial sense to pump the capital in. In the meantime, I'm putting the volumes in myself. And so over time, in the next three to five years or so, I believe that that facility will be op operational. And I think all farmers on the eastern end that deal with livestock, hopefully an increasing number, will be able to use it. Thanks. Okay, if anybody else has any more questions, you can ask them while we're eating sugar and <laughs> 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 no green teas. <laughs> I believe that, uh, I believe that Rick has um, gotten some of Stephen's um, beef, so you'll be yes. enjoying some of that in something that he's made. And there are four um, different colors. <laughs> <laughs>